This program is brought to you by Emory University. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Patrick. I didn't read those reviews. I don't recall them. But um, I, I could talk about some others that weren't as, as flattering as that. Uh, but I'll, I'll uh, spare you those. Um, I uh, really want to talk about this particular heritage today um, and why there is such a thing as a core, whether it's voluntary or not, and where the idea comes from. I'm simply using uh, Jefferson as an example of what, uh, what an education in the humanities once was and was really up until a generation or two ago and why the, uh, we, there's still something uh, to recommend this idea of reading a common set of books, not absolutely the same for everybody necessarily. Uh, core, cores needn't work that way, but uh, they have uh, as they've evolved. Uh, I simply want to use a lot of notes here and observations. I, when I uh, give talks, I often use uh, prepared scripts. I don't really have that today because I wanted to be a little bit more informal about it. Santayana, George Santayana, uh, the great uh, philosopher, late 19th century into the 20th century, he died in 1952, I think, um, Spanish-born, uh, lived in America for a long time, and uh, became a professor at Harvard. And a student of his, he thought, taught T.S. Eliot, among other people, so he had some uh, formidable uh, pupils. But uh, a student wrote about him later that when you met in a course of Santayana's for the first day, he would stand up and say to them all, I'm extending to you an invitation to think after a certain fashion. And I've often wondered what that meant. I now think it probably was his way of saying we're going to try to talk out of certain categories that are the expected ones, to think uh, freshly and perhaps a bit obliquely, and to walk along uh, different paths. He believed, I think, that, that the whole enterprise of education was about uh, to use a, an image by Proust, not so much uh, to think with different ideas, but to see with different eyes. That's how important all of this is. It's not just uh, credential chasing. It's supposed to be an operation upon the mind and the soul, believing in the, in the soul in the Aristotelian uh, sense. Um, there was nothing uh, fantastic about this idea for him, um, for Santayana, that is. Uh, he was simply connecting himself to a longer and larger tradition. And whenever we, uh, the inheritors of all this, sit down and read anything from Homer um, down to um, Thoreau and beyond, we are taking part in this idea that in order to live well, we need to be able to say that we are educated after a certain fashion. That is, that we've not simply memorized a bunch of facts, but we've thought about them. Um, and of course, memorizing that, I, I'm not uh, denigrating the idea of memorizing anything. I think all true good learning begins with memorization. Um, as a colleague of mine once said, what else do you do with French irregular verbs but simply memorize them? Um, and then you get to use them. Then you get to speak French, and then the fun begins. Um, so mem uh, the memory work is always especially important in any kind of um, education. Um, I'm often amused when people say, well, I, I'm somewhat interested in history, but I don't like names and dates. And I always say that, uh, well, surely history is more than names and dates, but it's nothing less than names and dates. It starts with the information, and then uh, we go along with them uh, and make something new called knowledge and understanding. I don't know how many of you, when you're going through airports, look at the books sold. I try to, I've done this for 20 years now, uh, when I've gone through airports. I, I use books sold in airports as a gauge of American culture. And, uh, and I was in two airports yesterday, uh, a little bit too long in each one. But uh, I did, uh, give me a, did give me an opportunity to look inside the, the bookstores. One thing that strikes many of us uh, who, who are past a certain age is how few books are sold in airports next to uh, 
the, the number that were sold. But, but yesterday, uh, I, thinking that this is an interesting measure of the modern mind, uh, that is who we are and who we're striving to be, uh, with or without college degrees and 4.0s and so forth, uh, I wanted to look at the titles of some of the books, again, as a gauge of who we are right now as a kind of snapshot. Here are some of the titles of books that uh, I saw in the airports but I did not buy. How to Talk So People Will Listen. Perhaps I should have bought that before this talk today. How about this one? Minute Motivators for Leaders. If you're not a natural leader, you can get some leadership qualities, apparently, in minutes. Like a lot of things, we are living in a microwavable world, I guess. How successful people think. I certainly should have uh, learned something from that. How to talk so your husband will listen, and listen so the husband will talk. I suppose that would, uh, would be of practical value to lots of people. And finally, Getting past, and this is a bit more serious, Getting Past What You'll Never Get Over. That is a, a book about uh, emotional pain and hurts and so forth. Well, <clears throat> what does any of this reveal, as I was thinking uh, on my way down to Atlanta? Um, however trivially packaged, so I, I think some of these books do reveal something, mostly that we feel, feel ourselves to be inadequate. After almost universal literacy, after so many people are going to good schools, getting college uh, uh, degrees, uh, certainly passing high school, we still don't think ourselves very adequately prepared for all kinds of things, including the things you would think would be almost instinctive, such as how to talk to your mate. We still don't think we know. And um, in a sense, we don't, because the human heart is complex. The human mind is complex. And there's a sense in which every generation has to learn anew uh, some of those, it's not so much skills, but, but some of those uh, beneficial habits of the mind that make for a better life. I think all of this is relevant to this whole idea of humanism, which I want to define in a minute. But I think the source of our inadequacy should encourage us to find answers uh, and to find them where others have found them before, which is usually in history, and tested them. Uh, and the history is a kind of crucible, a kind of uh, series of tests. And the humanities curriculum, so-called, uh, this is what was always ex it was always expected to do, to give us a sense of who we are by showing us where we've been, and to make us members of the club. You would think that we would be members of the club simply by virtue of having been born. But if you think of how all of us as babies come into the world simply as little bundles of appetite, uh, some people would say never get beyond that in their more sophisticated ways. And then other people want to go beyond that and want to enhance their lives a good deal more. Um, so knowing who we are based upon where we've been. Well, this is the world of Thomas Jefferson, uh, not just of um, so many other generations before and after, and I want to simply use his life to illustrate um, what I'm saying here. Because Jefferson, I, I think, has been used as a, as a model of the American sage, which in a sense gets us out of examining who he was and what he was about. We know him as the author of the Declaration of Independence, um, and of course this was on his tombstone, the author of the Virginia Statute for Religious Freedom, and of, as you know, some of you, um, uh, the father of the University of Virginia. Think about those three achievements that he wanted to be known by. Um, there's a sense in which they aren't primarily political, uh, they are spiritual, they're intellectual, and one could even say literary. He was the author of. He was the father of the University of Virginia. This was back probably when founding a university or a college wasn't a primarily political act. I suppose it would be now, certainly sustaining a university as a political act uh, these days. Um, so who was he? Um, 
we want to simply say he was a genius and there's nothing else to examine. Um, but I think there was more to Jefferson, and he certainly would have said that there was more to him uh, than, uh, than his DNA. His DNA, by the way, wasn't uh, tremendously impressive. Uh, he was an aristocrat, he was an, a Virginian aristocrat for what passed for the aristocracy in the 1740s and 50s. His father was not a particularly learned man, Peter Jefferson, but he had a trait that a lot of American parents have had ever since, which is the desire to give their children what they themselves did not have. Um, he did not get all the book learning that they would have called it at the time, but he wanted to make sure that his son did get it. And he was willing to hand his son over to people who knew better than he. He wanted his son to have the education of the Lords. And how would you get that education if you were born in 1743 on the frontier. This was the problem. Um, Peter Jefferson was successful enough, I suppose, in business, but he couldn't afford to send his son probably to a boarding school, uh, the closest of which would be very far away. There was a tremendous culture of Scottish tutors in Virginia at that time, perhaps all over the South. These were men who were ministers, and they're men of the cloth, and that was their primary work. But what they often did during the week was open the school, open a school, and it was a kind of uh, homeschooling for us. Um, beyond the reach of accreditation, which m must have allowed for all kinds of innovation of the best kind, um, every teacher could decide exactly what the, what the pupils would learn. But when they made the decision, they made sure that they, ha they were equipping them with the tools of learning more and more. So uh, back then, if you went to college or university with the classical languages, for instance, you had to get those before you got there. You couldn't get them in an elementary sense um, up till then. Uh, you had to do all of that as a child and as an adolescent. So Jefferson started his uh, work in Latin and Greek very early. It also came with French, because any cultivated man or woman at that time also knew French. So there would have to be at least one modern language you would have to learn, again, as a child, um, so that you would be equipped one day for college, which you would generally begin about the age of 16. Um, how they made the choices, I'm not exactly sure. Probably letters of recommendation from the tutors were everything. Uh, but he got a very thoroughgoing classical education in the languages probably with all the thrashing that we uh, uh, see in novels of the period for school children. Um, if you don't get your Greek participles correct, everything's fine. The teacher smiles and takes you out behind and gives you the switch uh, until you learn the stuff, and then you probably learn it fairly well. Um, so his life was, in a sense, typical of some people. We're still talking about an elite, of course. Most children didn't have this. If you think about it, most people on the planet right now are not doing what we have the luxury to do in this room right now, which is to think about such things. Most people are out uh, surviving. We have the leisure, either because we have worked for it or we simply have uh, the, the good luck to be born in certain families that have afforded this, this kind of uh, opportunity. That's the kind of family Jefferson came from. His father was a surveyor, like George Washington, um, so I'm sure he made sure the boy had very good arithmetic, uh, as any good surveyor would need. Uh, but then he went beyond that to make sure that someone else gave him um, all of the languages. He went to the College of William and Mary and started in the year 1760 and was there for two years, uh, 60 to 62. And it was here that he said he even more developed what he called a canine appetite for reading. Good way of putting it, a canine appetite for reading. That is, a will to learn and to be reflective about what one learned. You need both in order to have a full education, of course. It's not a matter of ticking down a number of books. You have to have read them uh, and digested them. I want to take you through what, even at the time, 
uh, was considered a typical day for him. And it wouldn't have been a typical day, I suppose, for everyone else. But he said that he lived a 19-hour day in college. And I want to see if his schedule, daily schedule, accords with yours uh, as undergraduates. He was up from uh, 5 in the morning till um, midnight. Uh, and as he said in a letter, it's all equal to me. All of those hours. They're all to be productive hours. So <clears throat> here's a sense of his day. Before 8 o'clock, now he's, I, I presume he's eating meals somewhere in here, uh, and probably out um, uh, trotting with his horse. But here's what he did before 8 a.m. He said, books on agriculture, anatomy, zoology, botany, ethics, natural religion, which was a strange 18th century term for usually a lot of the Latin classics, Cicero, Seneca, and so forth, because they wrote about a lot of ethical and moral things. That was his reading before 8 o'clock, books in those subjects. Uh, at Eight o'clock, from eight o'clock until noon, uh, he was to read the law and uh, commentaries on the law and, and whatever. There was a, an English jurist named Cook. He would have read that book, and in fact, he, he sweated through that book, he said later. Uh, but that was his uh, law training from eight to twelve. And then from twelve to one, he would read what was called politics. That could have been any number of subjects. It's like, the, it's like the word science. In 18th century, when you see the word science, it really means pursuit of knowledge generally, not necessarily physical uh, or theoretical uh, knowledge. Politics and economics. Interesting that he gives himself one hour for that and goes on. And then you get to afternoon reading, which, uh, as he put it, was Greek and Latin originals in history. That was his nice uh, light reading. And then I suppose he's going to take a, take a hike sometime and get, and get some nutrition. And then he said, from dark until bedtime, belle lettre, which would have been um, drama, oratory, and poetry. He later said that uh, since he was, he was bred in the law, he naturally had a dark view of humanity, uh, which, of course, legal study is likely to give any of us. Uh, so, he said, I have to read poetry in order to balance it out, because he doesn't want to see only the dark side of humanity. So I have to have poetry. And to the end of his life, he kept a very strong uh, a commonplace book of, of poems. He would copy poems all the time. And according to people who knew him, he memorized a good deal of it. Because as I hope you know, whenever you memorize something, you own it in an entirely different way. And you have a different relationship to that. Um, to that work. So this was Jefferson as a student, as a pupil, that is, someone going through a course of study. Um, but beyond this is the idea that college is mostly for reading and learning, if you think about it. It's not for social life. This is the time where you're supposed to do the most intensive reading and learning. Because, of course, later, as everyone still knows, and it is still true, Life intervenes, and you have to uh, do your work, and you don't have the leisure anymore, often, to do that kind of reading that you could do as a student. Um, of course, you would want to uh, have the uh, advantage of not having to work during this kind of a, a day. You wouldn't be able to live otherwise, I suppose. Uh, so where was this avidity for learning going? Uh, this idea that you properly live your life soaking yourself in the past and in language and in whatever's been learned, including botany and zoology and anatomy and so forth. Where is this all going? A larger point here is that this was supposed to set a pattern for life. We think of um, uh, learning now as, as, as a set of paces you go through simply. I go to college, I read all these books, and then I leave and never read them again. Jefferson probably would have believed that that's a waste of the learning. If that's all you were going to do with it, you probably should have just gone straight to work. But 
to have the education is to live with a kind of privilege, and privilege brings its responsibilities. One of them would be to keep, keep your learning going. And one thing you would do as a humanist of the Jefferson Stripe was to uh, start building a library. I don't know how many of you do this. I bet uh, a, a good number of you do. But a proper humanist, properly understood, is not someone who sells back his books often. He wants to keep them because he never knows when they're going to be uh, useful and get that sense of the humanistic idea of useful. We often want to talk about an education that's going to be useful. From the 14th or 15th century up to Jefferson's time, uh, the idea that this form of study was anything other than useful would have been absurd. Of course you're doing it because it's going to be useful in some way. It doesn't mean you're going necessarily to use this knowledge um, in a profession, but it's going to be useful because it is going to help develop and enhance your personality. That's also one of the great uh, faiths of humanism, which I can get into in a minute. So he was building his library. What did his libraries consist of? For those of us who are, who, who are lovers of books, it's great always to think about Jefferson's library, several of which he had, uh, some of which, uh, one of which he sold to make the colonel for the, for the Library of Congress in 1815. He simply emptied his shelves. I think he got $28,000 in, 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 in money at that time. He was uh, tremendously in debt. Uh, he'd already been president, of course. He said, that this is what should be the core of what congressmen should read. I'd like to send this memo to John Boehner and to, <laughs> to Senator Reid and others and say, if, if you've not read these things, I'm not sure you should be reelected. I'm not sure that would work. Um, we go through the list of books, and, and of course, he, he sells this library in order to put himself on a, a better financial footing, but what's he do as, as soon as the books are gone? He starts buying more. Uh, he couldn't stop buying books. Very few translations. Uh, I'm not sure what to make of this as a, as a lover of the classical languages. Uh, there weren't a lot of translations at that time uh, in the late 18th and early 19th centuries. A lot of these things had not been done. I do have a copy at home uh, of a book that was given to me as a gift. It was printed, <coughs> I think, around 1810. And I think Jefferson eventually had a copy of it. It is a it's two volume uh, Greek text of Homer's Iliad, um, with a lot of notes and so forth. A very nice Greek script, and you have notes of the apparatus, scholars' apparatus at the bottom. But <clears throat> what amuses me most is at the back of the book there is a Latin translation. If you want to cheat, that was the early <laughs> the early 19th century idea of cheating. The Latin is easy, so if your Greek is a little weak, now look back to the Latin, you'll be able to read that. Strange world. I don't think they're going to make presidents like this again. And he wasn't that, that unusual. John Adams was very much like this, too, which makes their, as I've said before, uh, their correspondence a liberal education in itself. Uh, if you really want to know how intelligent people think, read their correspondence, the Jefferson Adams correspondence. Anyway, very, very few translations which he called interpretations, which, if you think about it, is the way to think of a translation of any kind. It's someone else's idea of, say, what Homer said or what Cervantes said. It is an interpretation. And he wanted as little of that as possible. So there are uh, a good number of Greek and Latin books, books in French, books in Italian, Spanish, which he did teach himself, um, and Anglo-Saxon. What uh, is conspicuous here uh, for his absence is German. He did not really take his German very far. But uh, I think he can be excused for that if you think about what he did take far. One of the points to make here, too, is that none of these books was in his father's house. We Americans, I think, properly believe in self-improvement. Uh, look at the self-help sections in any uh, bookstore. It's the biggest one. Um, there's a good side to that in some of the books, book titles I was mentioning are self-help books. That's not a bad thing. Um, but he wanted to have what his father never had, just as his father wanted him to have the same thing. 
Uh, later he wrote, I thank him on my knees who was able to provide me with this, what he called, tremendous source of delight, that is, in learning uh, the uh, Greek and Latin tongues. Notice that he talks about what he gained not in terms of what gave him greater intellectual power, but what gave him pleasure. And uh, so for him, learning was more than a kind of head trip, an intellectual head trip, being able to use words like parameter and make everyone think you sound intelligent. For him, it was a matter of delight. And uh, we, never, we should never lose sight of that. So building a library. Um, Montaigne, I don't know if how many of you have read Montaigne, the essays of Montaigne. Uh, in his house in France in the 16th century, he was the great essayist, in fact, in a sense. He invented the essay form. Uh, he had many classical sayings in the original languages on his ceiling, simply to remind him. And there was a, the famous line from, uh, from Terence, uh, which was, nothing human is alien to me. That is the humanist idea. That is, the more you learn through history, through poetry, through the sciences, the more you really are part of the human club. The more you can conclude responsibly. And remember, we're talking about this early republic where people really didn't want to live like people in Europe anymore. They wanted more and more people to have this franchise of uh, intellectual power. Um, some of the books he had early, late in life, now, th th as I say, some of these, some people think that this is uh, impressive enough for a young man, but these were books that he kept reading. Uh, we have um, uh, s uh, notes that uh, he was reading the, the Scolia in Greek, uh, Stephanus' Thesaurus Linguae Graeci, and he kept around a glossary of medieval Latin, which he used to uh, consult a good deal. A fellow named Ticknor, one of his friends, visited him in 1824, and remember, he died in 1826. So this visit would have been made when Jefferson was about 81 years old. And this visitor uh, was walking through Monticello, and he looked at a, he saw a Greek lexicon that was printed in 1817, just seven years before, and as he wrote in, in his letter, this lexicon was much worn with use and contained many curious notes. Just what this man had been doing since the age of 74, still keeping his learning going. Of course, John Adams was doing much the same thing. At the age of uh, 81, he was beginning a, a new major multi-volume history of France. And this is what they talked about. Again, not only did they make presidents, did they make presidents differently, they make, made ex-presidents differently. Uh, so we're probably not going to see that again, as I say. He read deeply into history, um, including the Church Fathers. He was not a, an Orthodox Christian at all. Some say he wasn't a Christian at all, um, although he claimed it in several of his letters. He claimed to be a Christian, but I don't know whether that was simply good manners or not. Um, he thought Gibbon's work decline and fall of the Roman Empire. He thought it was fine, but he considered Gibbon a mere compiler. Awfully good compilation, though. Uh, he read deeply into Livy uh, and as many originals as possible, of course. Cornelius Nepos, uh, the, Greek his, uh, the, the Roman historian, uh, he read, um, we have evidence that he re read this book on his way to Poplar Forest from uh, Monticello. Poplar Forest was um, his country estate in Bedford County, so that would have been about a three-day journey, so he would take his classics books on the carriage um, and uh, read some of them to his granddaughters, who were probably equipped with enough uh, learning to, uh, to understand them. His idea of proper learning would have been Xenophon, Herodotus, these are books that we know he read and reread, Thucydides, Plutarch, Caesar, Tacitus, Cicero, Homer, and Virgil. So he arose, in a sense, out of a classical culture that was simply embroidered into American life. Um, uh, Dr. Maury, one of his uh, uh, Scottish tutors, when he was a child, uh, 
uh, had his own servants in the house. They were named Cato, Cleo, and Ajax. Uh, by the end of the 18th century, of course, we had uh, columnists who went by names like Crassus, Brutus, and Publius, of course, most famously from the uh, Federalist Papers. So it's heavy on language, heavy on history. This was the essence of the humanist uh, discipline. Um, I want to give a few characteristics, if I could, uh, it's not too much of a diversion, into what humanism meant. Uh, because today it is usually saddled with the adjective secular, uh, which to many people means it's godless. I mean humanism of the Erasmian kind, of the Sir Thomas More kind. Um, <clears throat> and it had certain characteristics, and I want to go through uh, just a few of them here. Uh, and, I, and I use um, Paul Fussell's here, uh, his help in going through them. Any good humanist of the Jeffersonian stamp had grave doubts about moral or qualitative progress. What he called, he didn't want any facile analogizing between moral and material progress. They believed in this idea of permanent human nature. If you believe that human nature is permanent, your idea of progress is going to be a little different. And of course, the humanist is necessarily a historian because he derives his values from history. I think it was <coughs> Patrick Henry, <coughs> uh, not originally, but I think he was noted among other things for saying that history is philosophy teaching by example. That's very 18th century. Those are the those are the people who really founded this country, who believed things like that, that history does teach. Another article of faith for the humanists, that problems cannot be solved, only difficulties handled. We're talking about the problems within, what, say, human nature. If human nature is constant, there are only difficulties to handle anew with each generation. But you can't flip a switch and have a kind of spontaneous progress that is going to continue from one generation to the other. There is the primacy of the mind and the imagination, symbol making, which is why there's a, such a veneration for literature, uh, mainly poetry, but as time goes on, more and more prose. Um, what I call the libido istimandi, the will to evaluate. Um, a good historian probably these days does not have to make judgments and probably shouldn't. Uh, a good historian at this time would think that that's the whole purpose of learning history in order to make judgments. Um, and that dovetails into this passion for the past, for what has been tested and proven. Uh, it's not enough to think ideologically. That is, my father thinks this, so I'm going to parrot this to you. The idea is to get your ideas from books and from ideas, and I suppose through discussion, too. Um, what Jefferson doesn't tell us about those days in William and Mary was how much he discussed ideas. Um, I suspect there was a good deal of discussion going on. Jefferson learned many things from these historians, one uh, Tacitus, of course. Um, interesting line that he put in several of his commonplace books. The more corrupt a commonwealth, he said, the more laws you have, and by extension, the more laws you need. So what is the effect of all this? I think it wa one was to make anyone who went through this kind of study suspicious of any uh, simple claims that were not supported by the witness of history. You can believe what you want, but if history does not prove it, that was prob that's probably not a good basis for belief. Also, I think in Jefferson's case, although he was one of the great political theorists of all time, he claimed to, dis to dislike theory and to distrust it. He said at one point, and I ask you to think about this sentence, the moment a person forms a theory, his imagination sees in every object only the traits that form that theory. Sounds like some thesis that is, theses that have been written, or, <laughs> or uh, certainly read by some of us. Um, very similar to uh, a line by uh, this philosopher, 
a Spanish philosopher, Ortega y Gasset later, who said, uh, create a concept and reality leaves the room. Uh, very Jeffersonian idea. So from his reading, uh, Jefferson garnered not a hard system, but what he called an accumulated canon of guidelines. This was, this was how the, in a sense, the Declaration of Independence got to be written by somebody like this, who had done his reading and had learned the lessons of history. Um, and this was knowledge that I would say was humanistically acquired, that is, in the spirit of learning having an effect on the human mind and soul. You don't learn it just so you know it. You, you learn it because you're going to use it. You're going to use it as a citizen. You're going to use it as a voter. You're going to use it as a parent. You're going to use it as someone who's equipped with a soul who's going to have to die someday. And you're going to have to face something, perhaps, or nothing. Either pieces of data are going to be uh, especially um, critical. So this isn't really an argument against theory. Jefferson was a student of Locke, after all. But it's an argument for prudent theorizing, and as I say, theorizing that is informed by history. All educated people, according to the humanists, are essentially historians. They want to make themselves historians, which means they want to live in time. They want to live along a timeline, and they don't want to assume that their age is necessarily better in all things than any other. I'd also say that the humanist faith comes from the Greeks, which can be summed up in the line, man can be greater than his fate. This is also a matter of, of humanistic uh, learning. So we go from, in our day, from, from uh, humanism to the humanities. And how has this changed? Well, pretty much. Now we think of uh, the humanities as useless information. Now, some of you have probably heard this from many people. What do you do with it? Of course, Jefferson would have said, you live and you die with it. What else do you need? But for us, we want to have something, I suppose, you can take to the bank. Um, it's, a, it's a course of study that is not necessary for all, but it is absolutely necessary for some if we are still going to live in a free country that is guided by precept and law and not simply the whims of, peop of the people who happen to be in power. Today we have all over the place, and you have here in your own form, a core curriculum. Uh, here it's voluntary. Notice how it's not been voluntary for most people <coughs> through time. But of course the essence of it is this idea of conversation, which is a, de a debased word now. Everyone's having a conversation about everything. But this is supposed to be an ongoing one, and it's the essence of the humanistic enterprise. Jock Barzin said this. Conversa it comes all down to conversation. How you can trade ideas amongst yourselves. Also this idea of self-culture comes in. That when we read, we are developing the self and developing the personality. John Henry Newman, in the 19th century, said that a liberal education implies an action upon our mental natures and the formation of our character. So again, back to this idea of the enhanced personality. It's not just reading a bunch of books. It's making sure that the books change you, that you are going to be somebody else by the time you get through reading them. So different that you're going to keep going back to them. Obviously, this was an age of rereading. The goal of, I think, any good uh, core curriculum, and I'll end in a couple of minutes here, is intellectual and emotional maturity. It remains that way in the best places. And this includes, I suppose, taking an interest in things that are a little bit out of one's range. Uh, to read Herodotus is not an obvious thing to do. But it is a vital thing to do if you want to know what it felt like to be living in the ancient world, because you want direct witness. I'm not going to get into whether it's better to read him in Greek or English or any other vernacular. We'll just say reading Herodotus counts, going back to an original voice. That fits very much into the spirit of any kind of core. 
and the idea that the object of learning is to become happier. We would say better adjusted now because we're living in the backwash of a lot of uh, psychological speak. But it comes down to the same thing, the beata vita, the, the happy life, the contented life. And of course, the idea of a curriculum at all, if you think about it, comes from a Latin word for a course. You run the course. And if you're a runner, I was a runner, um, it would be as though an, an elective system would be like saying, well, I'm going to run the first few yards. Then I'm going to sit down, and then I'm going to cross over and run to the end over here. The idea of a curriculum is to do the whole thing, however many times you have to, to make one mile, five miles, ten miles. Um, the elective system really is fairly new. I don't know how many of you know when it started. President Eliot of Harvard became president, I believe, in the 1860s. And he was really the father of this idea that you come to college and you decide all of, pretty much all of your courses. Um, not a bad thing in, in one sense because it is, in a sense, the road to freedom. But the question that remains is, uh, is it a road to intellectual freedom? Um, they looked at, at any kind of curriculum in the way that some people might look at braces for teeth. You put them on and they hurt and they're going to keep hurting and they might make you look ridiculous for a long time, but when they're taken off, something has changed. Your face is different now. Your teeth are different. They're straighter. They would have said that there's, some, there's a good analogy here that learning should be painful for a while. And then the more you go on, it's like learning the French irregular verbs. I think you know, Robert Frost once defined poetry as organized violence on language. Uh, we might think of education as organized violence on the mind. It's taking something that, a, a mind that's perfectly free of all this stuff and saying, this is important, stuff this in. But you stuff it in and then you use it. And the longer you live, the ideal being, uh, the more educated and more cultivated you become. And few things, of course, are more transformative. So I think I'll leave it there. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.